so he will uh, have this close relationship with God that there is a, a interaction that he would uh, pray to God and read the Bible and let the Word of God speak to him and then respond to the moves of the Holy Spirit so this is the close relationship there is an interactive relationship and then for love God with all the heart because when person have real faith in God then he will love him he will treasure God and say you know loving God means we treasure God we see that God is very important God is very precious God is beautiful God is loving so we like God we hold on to God we please with him so that's loving God and obeying God also so loving God includes a number of factors that we appreciate him we hold on to him we thank Him, we like Him, and we put Him in the first place in our life and we want to obey Him. And then the fruit related to good works. First, uh, number five would be to obey God, especially the Great Commission. And then number six, serve God, including glorifying God and blessing God, uh, blessing people in Jesus, in daily life and in ministry. So, so these are the six fruits, so we hope we remember, and then we'll go through this, the questions. So repent and turn away from sin, trust in Jesus as Savior and Master, and a close relationship with God, uh, love God, obey God, and serve God. And I hope you remember these six points. Okay, now continue repent of our sins and turn away from sins. John 5, 14, it, uh, Jesus says, Don't stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So Jesus said to the man healed of 38 years of sickness, He said, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So when a person sins, something worse can happen to, to, to us when we sin. So what worst thing can happen? The worst thing can happen to, to the body, to the sickness, to the spiritual life, to his family, to his relationship with people, to his ministry, to everything in his life. And also opening the way to Satan to attack him. If we ask God to forgive our sins, will our sins still bring destruction? Now, someone commit a sin and then he asks God to forgive him. And if he continue to obey God, he will minimize the effect of the sin. But still, every sin has some destructiveness. Let me explain this. Even after we ask God to forgive us, if someone yells at his wife and gets angry with her and hurt her and then he's sorry and then he asks God to forgive him and asks his wife to give, forgive him and God will forgive him for sure the wife should forgive him but sometimes the wife doesn't really forgive and in the wife's heart he might, she might remember how he has hurt her so it would hurt the relationship even though the wife is willing to forgive, still it leaves a sting in her heart. So this is the consequence of sin. When we hurt someone, it's hard for the hurt to totally be removed. The, the hurt will stay. It will hurt the relationship. And some people who are not easy to forgive, the relationship will be hurt forever. And some people, even though they can forgive, still the person will be cautious toward this person who hurt him because he doesn't trust him anymore. He cannot trust him anymore. Now forgiveness and trusting are two different things. For instance, if a pastor has sinned and then he asks for forgiveness and the people say, okay, we forgive you. But does it mean that people can f trust the pastor to be really following God all the time? The people might not have that trust as before already so trusting is a different thing so if we sin it can hurt relationship with the family members with friends with the church with ministry uh, with himself and also with God God now God is willing to forgive if the person is really repentant and turn away from sin God is very happy to bless the person but still there are some consequences of sin sometimes there's a consequence of punishment by the law the sometimes consequence that he has to pay a penalty of money or, uh, or the relationship has been hurt or his ministry if a pastor has committed a serious sin he might have to leave the ministry even though he might 
repent and then later do some other ministry later. But if he has, if he has committed some serious sin, he, he might have to leave his ministry. For instance, if he has committed adultery, it's very hard for him to stay in that ministry anymore. If he asks God to forgive him, he can be forgiven. But the sin will still have the consequence, still bring destructiveness. So when we understand this, hope we treasure our life and say, we only live once. And if we keep on losing things, we will lose more and more, and then we have nothing left except the salvation of Jesus Christ. If people, you know, uh, uh, they trust in Jesus, they continue to trust in Jesus and follow God, they still have the forgiveness and the salvation. But if a person continues to sin and hurt people, what happens is he can lose his family, he can lose the relationship with the church members, he can lose his ministry, he can lose his job. Everything can be lost. He can become a beggar. So we understand sins are very destructive. And now for many people they say, what well, they're used to yelling at people, what happened is people don't trust him anymore. They don't trust him anymore because he yelled at people a lot of time. Okay, Galatians 6, 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap destruction. So if we follow the flesh, the sinful nature will reap destruction. Why do many Christians continue to sin after they are converted? Why do many Christians continue to sin? I think one big reason is people don't realize the destructiveness of sins. I think there has not been enough preaching, enough clear teachings about this. People think when they are forgiven, then the sins will go away. They have to understand that there is a consequence of sin. There is a destructiveness of sin. And the reason is people think that uh, many of the things they did wrong are not sins. For instance, people think that worry, worrying is not sin. Worrying basically is lack of faith in God. Lack of faith, anything lack of faith is sin. And anything we're not glorifying God. And a person is sad all the time, he's not glorifying God. He's sinning. Can you imagine in heaven, the Christian will still be very sad? They won't be like that. If Christians in heaven are still very sad, then they are not glorifying God. But when we look at a Christian on earth, many Christians are sad and angry and frustrated and they don't forgive easily because the nature of this person is affected by sin. It's not just, you know, many people think of righteousness is just abstaining from some sins. They didn't realize it's the nature of the person. The, patron, the person has a lot of anger, frustration, hatred, sadness, all this nature are sin. This nature is sin. So when we sin, even when we repent and ask for forgiveness, what can happen to our lives? Now I explained that already, that can bring destruction to his whole life. Will we be forgiven when we ask Jesus to forgive us? Yes, He will forgive us. But the destructiveness will still continue. But the destructiveness can be reduced if we obey God immediately as much as we can. But when a person continues to sin again and again, for instance, if a person continues to steal, he will lose trust with many people and then the words will spread, this person steal. It will be very hard for him to find a job. And if he loses the trust of his wife, it's very hard for the wife to trust him again. So we realize, we need to realize that even with forgiveness, there's still many destructive co uh, consequences of sin. And also the reason why many people continue to sin because they don't treasure their life. They think their life is not going to go any higher. They didn't realize that their lives are very precious. So we need to understand our lives are very precious. God has a wonderful plan in our life and we can do great things. We can become great people. Even uneducated people can become great people. When we love God, when God's nature shows through us, then our whole life will glorify God and then God is happy to us and He will raise our life to a high, high level. Okay, and then 
so I'm going through the, uh, the fruits of salvation now. First fruit is the repentance of sin and turning away from sin. Ephesians 4.26 In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. How do Christians give the devil a foothold? Any sin we commit, the problem between husband and wife, with the friend, with the church, and with ourselves, anything that we, you know, any sin we commit, it will cause, it will break relationship, it will hurt relationship, it will take away our peace, our joy, all these are the foothold of the devil. The devil is very happy to break marriages, to break people's relationship, to break churches. The devil is very happy to break any kind of healthy relationship. And also, the devil is very happy to take away the joy and the peace and the motivation from a Christian. So when we sin, we will let the, let the devil steal these things from us. And then our life will not be able to go higher and higher. Now, if a person continues to sin many times, sin many, many times, he repent and try to change many, many times, what happens is, it's hard to go back to plan A, as I talk about the plan, the perfect plan of God. When we obey God all the way, it will plan A, and then if we uh, sin, and then we'll go down uh, to B, C, D, E, F, G. And if the person repent and he can go high up again, but it's very hard to go back to plan A unless if the person really uh, have still have the chance. But when we don't have the chance anymore, we cannot restore the. Uh, when someone sin, he breaks his marriage and the relationship with people. Sometimes it's very hard to restore all this relationship, and it's very hard to restore the peace and joy in the hearts. Uh, then he is hard to for him to go back to the plan A. Plan A has to be people who really trust in God and enjoy God and have the motivation to serve God and is full of the grace of God. John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. When the devil finds a foothold, what will he do to the person? He will steal, kill and destroy. He will steal things from him. His marriage, steal the healthy relationship, steal his uh, spiritual gifts, steal his church relation, uh, relationship and church ministry, the devil will steal whatever he can put the f uh, foot in. Whenever he had find a foothold to put the foot in, then he will destroy that area. So how does the devil destroy a person? He will destroy the person step by step. He will destroy the peace and the joy he will destroy the relationship with God and the relationship with people and then this person will lose his jobs, will lose his relationship with the church and then gradually he has no confidence in God and then he could lose his salvation. Can you describe some people being destroyed by the devil? So this is something for you to do. That Have you met someone like that? I have, I have seen people like that. I have seen pastors who committed adultery and has to be put in jail. <clears throat> or uh, the news about his sin was put on newspaper. Uh, I've seen pastors who died uh, of reasons that I don't know. There must be something bad that happened to him that his life has become so destroyed that uh, I don't know what happened that people could die. Um, I've seen pastor who complains to God even when I talk with them they say well God I, I told him first we want to praise God he said I cannot praise God and he said why because my ministry is not going well my relationship with my family is not going well my health is not well and I look at his life he has worry he has negative thinking he is uh, he doesn't have faith in God. So what happened is his whole life is being destroyed. Even pastors sometimes say, God is not treating me well. And they, when they're complaining, they are cutting off from God who is the only one who can bless him. So 
because they don't see the blessings of God, they don't see the grace of God, then they can be cut off from God gradually. So the first thing we want to build up is to always count the blessings of God. Count the blessings of God in nature, in the food, in our body that He has created, in uh, that in salvation Jesus died for us, that in the Holy Spirit, His work, that He has changed our lives, that He has saved us, helped us in uh, many times, that He has given, given us spiritual gifts. So we thank God for all this, that we have helped people and blessed people. We look at all this and treasure that. That way, we are building up on the foundation of Jesus Christ. But some people are building on complaining, worrying, sins, and even stealing money. I met a pastor who has been very you know, questionable in the way he used the money that our organization has sent to help him. And he refused to give me a count. And I said to him, what you've done is very serious, that you can face the punishment of God. And he did not respond to me. And, and uh, you know, I don't feel bad because of the money lost. I feel bad because he could lose salvation. So I hope we all see the destructiveness of sin and then we say, yes, sir. Lord, I want to have a close relationship with Him. I don't want to be destroyed by sin, okay? And then continue to repent of our sins and turn away from sin. I still the questions on that. Galatians 5.19 Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, re uh, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so how can people who have committed these sins be safe? So it says here that those who come practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want to say that Christians commit these sins. Christians have selfish ambitions. Christians have adultery or fornication, uncleanness. They have hatred contentions, fightings, jealousies, and wrath, and uh, envy. So Christians have this sin. So what, how can we be saved? What Paul was saying is, any of these sins can bring eternal damnation. So we need to repent of our sins and ask God to forgive us. And then we can be forgiven. So. Paul was saying any sin can bring destructiveness, can bring eternal damnation. So we need to repent and then we can be forgiven. So what will happen to people if they commit these sins and don't repent? If they commit this sin and don't repent, they will lose salvation. What is this passage warning people about? The passage is warning people about any kind of sin. Any kind of sin, anything negative is sin. Okay, and then next is continue trust in Jesus as Savior and Master. John 1 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So what does receiving Jesus mean? Receiving mean, Jesus means letting him come into our life to be our Lord and Savior and our Master. Let him take over our life. Is believing just a head activity? No, it's not just a head activity. It is the whole person trusting in Jesus, holding on to Jesus. Let Jesus take ownership of our life and, and uh, to be our Lord and Master. What will people who receive Jesus become? When they receive Jesus, they will become children of God. So this is a sure promise of God. Uh, is there a stand still? Now, I, I want to say that on my side, uh, Facebook is working. Um, 
so it's not it's not on my side it's um uh that i can see that my facebook is still uh running so it's on your side okay and then uh and then number three the third fruit now remember the first fruit is um repenting and turning away from sin and the second is trusting continue trust in jesus as savior and lord and number three is having a close relationship with god john 15 5 i am the vine you are the branches he who abides in me and i in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing if anyone does not abide in me he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned why abiding in jesus will bring much fruit so if we abide in jesus uh, will bear much fruit because jesus is the source of life jesus is life he's the resurrection and the life inside him is full of life so when he lives in people his life would change people jesus is full of life and love and mercy and kindness so when he lives in people his quality his life quality would change people now if you can see continue to see my video please let me know because um okay um okay if we don't have a close relationship with god what will happen to us then we'll be like a branch that is withered and together and thrown in the fire so if a person doesn't have a close relationship with god he can be thrown in the fire and have eternal punishment and go to hell so when we abide in jesus we'll have fruits of salvation so it's very important that the relationship with God is very, very important. It's not just head knowledge, but it's a living relationship with God. Okay, and then the fourth fruit is uh, love God with all our heart. Mark twelve thirty, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. So what does it mean that this is the first commandment? That this is the most important commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart? So why does God want us to love Him? Because God is love, and the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. Everyone in the kingdom of God loves. That way, there is unity and there, the blessings of God can come to us. If we don't love God, if we don't love God, then we're not open to God, then God's life cannot come into, then God's life cannot come into that person, and God cannot change the person. So we need to have the love of God to change our life. We need the love of God. We need the presence of God. When we love God, His presence will come to us. So we're, we're connected to God when we love God. So why is it hard for people to love God? It's hard for people to love God because most people did not grow up in much love. Even in many families, there's a lot of yelling and fighting and beating and anger and frustration and disobedience. So that's why in a lot of families, there's not much love. So when they believe in Jesus, they just want to take something from God. They don't want to love God. They won't, don't want to appreciate God. They, don't, they haven't learned to appreciate God because they don't appreciate people. So people's nature has been corrupted people's nature has been corrupted by sin most people are corrupted by sin in many many ways so we want to repent of our sin and ask God to forgive us and uh, so that our life will be changed and then when we love God then our whole life will, will uh, you know when we trust in God and love God then we are connected to God and then God can change our life so that we have more love but many People that grew up in hatred, in fighting, yelling, uh, in uh, frustration, in negative thinking, in emotions, then uh, it's hard for them to have love. So their life has to be changed by God. There has to be inner healing. 
What does it mean to love God? To love God means to we appreciate God, we treasure God, we say God is wonderful, we like God, we hold on to God, we treasure Him, we want to love, praise Him, we want to honor Him, we want to obey Him. So all these are the fruit of loving God. That we like God, we appreciate Him, we thank Him, we treasure Him, we hold on to Him. We have a close relationship with Him and we obey Him and serve Him and we do things to please Him. Okay, still loving God with all our heart. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. So here it says, if anyone doesn't love Jesus, let him be accursed. So what will happen if someone does not love God? If someone does not love God at at all he can be cursed that means there is something wrong with his faith with his faith when his faith is healthy then he would bear the fruit of loving god then he would love god he would love people if he doesn't love people that means there is something wrong with his faith and and then he if he has zero f f uh, love for god he might have uh, his faith in god might have problem and he might not be born again then the person need to repent and trust in Jesus as Savior and ask God to give him a new life. And, and uh, when he trusts in Jesus as his Savior, then his life can be born again. Why is this so serious when someone does not love God? Because in the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. If he doesn't, does, doesn't love God, that means he's not connected to God. He doesn't appreciate God. Then God cannot come to bless him. Then he has... He also has hatred. If he doesn't love God, he loves him, who loves him so much, then he would have hatred. When he have these qualities instead of love, then there is something wrong with his uh, spiritual life. So, uh, so it's very serious when the person doesn't have a healthy spiritual life with love. What holds the kingdom of God together is love that holds the kingdom of God together. If someone does not love God at all, does he have saving faith? He might not have saving faith. Now, if a Christian have very weak love for God, then he should repent and count the blessings of God and say, God, you have blessed me so many ways. I want to appreciate you and I want to learn to love you. Just as we want to learn to love our parents, love friends who are so nice to us, we want to, to love and appreciate them. What will happen to someone who does not have saving faith? If he doesn't have saving faith, then he's not born again. He cannot go to heaven. So uh, when a person is born again, then he will bear fruit. And so far we have talked about first repentant, repentance and turn away from sin. And number two is to continue to trust in Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. And then to have a close relationship with God and then to love God. And then the last two would be actions. Number five would be to obey God. Obey God, especially the Great Commission. Matthew 7.21 not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And when, then I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, uh, so... This verse says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, many people say, Lord, 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 help me, save me, forgive me, uh, uh, heal me. Not, these people are not necessarily all uh, uh, saved and can enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So when people have saving faith, they will obey God. If they don't obey at all, they say they believe in Jesus and then they continue to yell at people, hurt people, steal money and commit adultery, then there is something wrong with his spiritual life. Then uh, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But we are not saved by doing good. We are saved by faith, uh, grace through faith. But when we are saved by grace through faith, then our, uh, our faith in God will produce uh, fruit of salvation. Now many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? So many people said, they have done things, good things in the church. 
But why can these people be saved? And then Jesus would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Jesus said, I didn't know you. That means he did, Jesus did not have a relationship with the person. The person doesn't have a relationship with God. So what it means is, he just does external ministry. But in his heart, he doesn't obey God. He doesn't turn away from sin. He might steal money. He doesn't turn away from his angers. He hurt people without repentance. He might tell lies. He might uh, not forgive people. So all these life qualities thing he did not do. He just does the external things to prophesy or cast out demons. Now I have heard people who who said they are prophets and then they do it for money. Now I'm not saying everyone who take offering for his income is wrong. You know, it's not wrong. It's right. But if people just want money and some people want money in such a way that they uh, use the Bible in a wrong way in order to motivate people to give. They say, okay, you give so much and then you will get so much back next month and then you will, it will solve your problems financially. The Bible didn't tell us to give in order to solve our financial problem. The way to solve a financial problem is to trust in God and obey Him and follow Him. But we don't say, okay, I give this month, next month I'll get the money back. It doesn't necessarily happen like that. But people, many people preach like that. It doesn't necessarily happen like that. When we follow God in the long run, God will bless our whole life. But it just, it doesn't come instantly. And God is a plan if the person sincerely obey God. Now some people it's like this. They don't obey God in many ways. They just obey God in one area. They say, I, I give. And then hopefully I'll get more money. Now I, I want to uh, say that prosperity uh, gospel is not from the Bible because what's wrong is that they want uh, to get money. They want to get rich. They say, if a person loves God, he has to get rich. That's not true. It's not necessarily true that a person will be rich, but he will have provision for his life and for his ministry. So God has promised us that, but we don't necessarily become rich. We'll have enough for what we need and for serving God and obeying God and following God's will. So, um, so some people, you know, want to motivate people to give by telling them lies that the Bible didn't say. So we don't want to do that. Now, some people do that in order to get money to do a bigger ministry. They just want to do a bigger ministry. They don't necessarily, they're not necessarily serving God. So I hope we discern the prophets that uh, they're prophets that only talk about money uh, and also they want uh, people to pay for their uh, service like praying for the sick. Uh, people have to pay for that. Now this is not biblical. This is not biblical. We want to serve God freely and it's right for people to give offering. It's right. But we don't want to force people to give by telling them if you give you'll get this benefits now it's true that when people give god will bless them but it might not come instantly and it also might not you know is make them rich people uh, the bible does promises that seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added to us okay um so these people who do ministry, cast prophesy and cast out demons and do many wonders. They might not have a living relationship with God and then they might not have salvation. So, so uh, Jesus does not know the person. That means, that means uh, Jesus does not have a relationship with him. He doesn't, he doesn't pray to God from the heart. Now some people just pray with the mouth and some people just shout prayers. Oh. God do wonderful things. God bring healing here. It's all, you know, it's all um, miracles. It's just miracles. I believe in miracles, but our life is not just miracles. We want to have prayer of relationship with God. God, you are full of love. You are full of mercy. I want to live in your love. I want to live in your goodness. I want, we want everyone here, everyone here come to God with 
trusting in His love and His mercy, we want to forgive, uh, repent of our sin and ask for forgiveness, and we want to love God and respond to God. Oh Lord Jesus, it's building up the relationship of the people with God. It's not just healing, healing, money, money. It's so we want to look at the right things. So, so people casting out demons are not necessarily doing God's will because in their life they're not found doing God's will. Now, casting out demons is right. If people obey God and then they cast out demons, it's right. But if they don't obey God and then they cast out demons, it's not acceptable to God. According to this verse, what two things are the necessary fruit of salvation? Now, there are two things here necessary. First, does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So when we do the will of my Father who is in heaven, uh, obeying God. And the second thing is knowing Jesus and Jesus knowing us. So the two things necessary uh, for uh, salvation is that we obey God and also we have the relationship with God that God, Jesus will say, I know you. So that's the, the third point we just talked about, the relationship with God, that we have this relationship, uh, interactive relationship that we repent of our sin and ask God to forgive us and and, uh, uh, and then we obey Him and we serve Him. So there's an interactive, uh, interactive uh, prayer. When we pray to God, we respond to God and obey Him. Okay, this is the last point now. Serving God, including glorifying God and blessing people in, uh, in Jesus in daily life and in uh, ministry. So what it means here is serving God is not necessarily taking a position in church. Now some people don't have a position in church, but anything we do to glorify God, when we tell people God is wonderful, I love God, God has done wonderful things to us, He is a loving God, that this is glorifying God, then it's also already serving God because He is letting people see how wonderful God is and blessing people in Jesus. That means uh, Blessing people to know Jesus, blessing people to follow Jesus and obey Jesus, so that is building his relation, their relationship with Jesus. So it's a building up people's spiritual life and bringing them to Jesus, in daily life and in ministry. So in our daily life, that we are glorifying God and blessing people, in our daily life and in our ministry. Matthew twenty-five twenty. Lord, you deliver to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So these verses say, Lord, you deliver to me five talents. Um, that so the master gave five talents to one servant and two talents to another one and one talent to the third servant. And then, uh, and then this servant came back and said, Lord, you have given me five talents and I've gained five more. And the Lord said to him, well done, well done, you've do, done a good job. You are a good and faithful servant. So good means good quality. His life quality is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And faithful, he is faithful to do the things God has told him to do. So two qualities are very important. Uh, the inner quality, being good. And the second is faithful, being faithful to God, obey, to obey God. And then you were faithful over a few things. When I read this Bible verse one day, you know, suddenly I said, over a few things. Why this servant is faithful over a few things? So I said, I want to be faithful over more things. So I want... I build up the habit of loving God all the time, praising God all the time, thinking about God all the time. And when I do that, then I, have more, I will think about God more and then I will have more motivation to serve God and glorify God in my daily life. So uh, the more we love God and obey Him, the more we glorify God in our daily life, then we are faithful over more things. And I'll make you ruler over many things. Uh, in a new heaven and new earth, and then enter into the joy of your Lord. So we, the heaven is full of joy, and we can enjoy His joy. Explain two qualities, good and faithful. Good is, means the inner quality. Faithful means uh, to obey. How can we be faithful over more things? 
when we trust God more, have a good relationship with God, and always glorifying God, then we are faithful over more things. To think about God all the time and glorify God all the time and blessing people all the time, as much as possible. What is one important quality of God in heaven? Is joy. God is full of joy and He's also full of love and full of holiness. If God does make the faithful one ruler over many things in heaven, will they rule over many things on earth? So now the Bible verse doesn't say this. So if God made the person rule over many things in heaven, will he rule over many things on earth? The Bible verse here doesn't say it. But from other Bible verse that uh, that the Bible tells us that that he can increase our dominion that uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. So we can also rule over many things when we have a good nature, a l nature of love and joy and peace, and also when we obey God and serve God more, then God can uh, make us ruler over more things that we can help more people. When we love God, God will seize our heart and then God will use us. Now, I give these teachings out freely and my motivation, I, my, my wish is that you all learn this and then you can teach it. That you learn from me how to first analyze the Bible, study the Bible, look at the important words in the Bible verse, look at the whole context and to explain it and to understand the scripture and help people to love God and obey God. And, and you're welcome to spread this to many places and then God will be happy with you and He'll bless your life and use you mightily. So I hope we all hunger for obeying God, being good and faithful servant. Okay, and then 25, 27. And then the servant who has not used the talent and buried the talent. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the servant buried the talent and, and uh, the Lord said to him, you should have this deposited my money with the bankers and then you can receive the interest back. So this should mean offering that he could offer to God. Now offer with a heart of blessing the kingdom of God, uh, with a heart to love God. Then God will receive it as good works. Even when, now of course it's best that we can serve God in many ways, but the minimum that we can do is to, uh, to give offering to God. So this unprofitable servant, lazy, wicked and lazy servant is cast out into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where is the outer darkness and the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth? Now there are some people say that there is a third place, heaven and hell, and there is a third place called gnashing of teeth. Now this is not scriptural because the Bible talks about that, you know, in, in the future when people rise from the dead, some people rise to eternal life and some people uh, rise to eternal death. So it's either eternal life or eternal death. There is no middle place. So this place of weeping and gnashing of teeth is hell. This is hell. Some people say, well, he believes in Jesus, so he just uh, is not faithful. They separate believing faith and being faithful. And I want to say this, every real Christian must be faithful. Now, he might be faithful more th over more things or less things, but he still have, will bear fruit. If a Christian doesn't bear fruit at all, then there is something wrong with his faith, and then he cannot be. Uh, he's not born again. He, he doesn't have eternal life. So we need to understand that uh, uh, the fruit of salvation are necessary. They are not the cause of salvation, but the result of salvation. Now there are some people who say things like this. This is not scriptural. They say that. Uh, some people are saved but not born again. They say, well, when they believe in Jesus, they are saved. Uh, but they still sin and commit all these sins. And then when they one day they are changed and they are born again. And I want to say this, if a person says he believes in Jesus and he's not changed, he's not born again, he's not saved. Because 
Real salvation will always bear fruit. This is very important. Real salvation always bear fruit. We're not saved by the fruits. We're saved by grace through faith, but faith will always bear fruit and bring change to the person. If the person doesn't change at all, he has not been born again. Now there are some, I've heard some people taught that. So I hope we don't teach that. Oh, you uh, they teach this. Uh, if you believe in Jesus, you're saved. Uh, if you want uh, uh, rewards, then you serve God. If you don't reward, you just believe in Jesus. That's not true. Uh, every Christian must bear this sixth fruit, as I show you from the Bible verses, that he must continue to repent of his sins and obey God. Uh, uh, you turn away from the sin and then trust in Jesus Savior and then have a close relationship with God and love God and obey God and serve God and I show from the Bible verses these are all necessary if a person is saved he must have these fruits uh, these are the uh, necessary fruit of salvation now someone says how about someone who is dying and then he believes in Jesus now even a dying person anything he does out of the life of God, the life of God inside him. If he says, oh, yes, I want Jesus. Yes, I want him to forgive me. Or he nod his head. I want Jesus. So whenever he has this real desire, it's already the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So each person must have fruit of the Holy Spirit inside him. And uh, now even person dying, when he glorifies God, when he says, God is good, I believe in Jesus, he's already glorifying God. So, but that's the minimum. We don't want to stay at a minimum because we know that God is pleased with us when we serve God, so we want to serve God more. So, uh, in the future, is there a third place there other than heaven and hell? No, there is no. Why is this servant cast into outer darkness? Because his faith does not bear fruit. He does not... Uh, he does not use his talents. He buried his talents. Okay, and then the, the third parable in Matthew 25, this is about the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on the right, his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, to, uh, to one of the least of these my brethren you did it to me so the king will say to those on the right hand side and say come you blessed of my father those who uh, did the good things to the to Jesus brothers come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world so the kingdom of God they will inherit the kingdom of God and the king will answer them they say when did I do these good things to you he say I and as much as you did it to one of the least of this, my brethren, you did it to me. So when we do it to Christians, this Bible verse says, do it to Christians. Or do it to someone in order to bring them to, to be Christians. So when we do good to people and help them, give them water and food, in order to bring them to Jesus, that's already serving Jesus. What is the necessary fruit of salvation here? The necessary fruit is to serve God and glorify God and help Christians. Or help people to believe in Jesus. So good works in heaven is not just doing good to the general public without telling them about Jesus. It's doing good by telling them about Jesus or doing good to the Christians. According to this verse, is it hard to please God? No, because anything, little thing we do, we give a cup of water, we give food, we visit someone, all this God remembers. So it's not hard to please God. What is the kingdom mentioned here? The kingdom here is the kingdom of God, eternal life, heaven, new heaven and new earth. Okay, and then still about serving God. And so the sheep, uh, now to the goats. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on the left side, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Was verse 45. Then he will answer, he will answer them, saying, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And this will go away into 
everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal fire, in, uh, eternal life. I'm sorry, but the righteous will be go, uh, going into eternal life. So here it says that uh, those on the left side, because they did not do it to the one, uh, the Jesus brothers, then they are cursed by God, and they into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels and uh, because you did not do it to one of the least of these you did not do it to me and they will go into everlasting punishment so those Christians who don't bear fruit they don't they don't glorify God at all they don't bless other Christians at all they don't help other Christians at all they just cut down people or hurt people then they could lose salvation they might not have eternal life and then the righteous, those who do good, believe in Jesus, then we are saved. When we believe in Jesus, then we will bear fruit. So that's a necessary fruit of salvation, to, to bear fruit, to love people. Then they'll have eternal life. Those who bear fruit will have eternal life. These verses also tell us that judgment is according to works. Now, we're not saved by works. But judgment will be according to works to show that the person has faith. You look at this verse, you look at verse uh, Matthew 25 and other places. You see that judgment is according to the works of the person to prove that whether the person has eternal life. Is it necessary for every Christian to do good to Jesus? Yes, every, uh, to Jesus' brothers and serve God. Yes, it's necessary. If he doesn't do that, he might not have salvation, he might not have a relationship with God and he might not have eternal life he can go to hell how do we explain salvation by grace through faith and the necessity of serving God so we'll say it like this how do we explain salvation by grace through faith is not by works and yet works are necessary that we are saved by grace by free gift of God through faith when we trust in Jesus then we are saved but when we are saved the Holy Spirit will live in us. When the Holy Spirit lives in us, we'll bear fruit. <clears throat> Our life will change. We don't want to sin. We want to love God. We want to obey God. And we want to bless other people. So all this will bear fruit. And God has prepared all these good works for us to do. And if a person doesn't bear fruit, that means the Holy Spirit is not in him. That means his faith is dead. Then he will not bear fruit. So it's necessary to bear fruit because when a person is really saved, he will have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will prompt him to obey God and serve God. Okay, so we finish here. So the six points, I hope you remember the six fruits. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works. But when we're saved, we have these fruits. First, we'll be continue to repent and turn away from sin. Second, I hope you memorize with me. Number two is to continue to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord and then relationship to have a close relationship with God and love God and then work good works to obey God and to serve God. So I hope we all will obey God and serve God and uh, we all trust in Jesus and then when we have a close relationship with God then we will bear fruit. Now what if someone has no motivation to serve God? Then we tell him, ask him, do you appreciate God for saving you? Do you appreciate God for taking you from hell and giving you eternal life? And is it a great blessing? If that's a great blessing, do you want other people to have eternal life also? And also, the Bible has told us that when we are born again, then for sure we'll bear fruit. If we don't have these fruits, that means there is something wrong and the person can be lost. So we, don't, we want to uh, serve God and obey God and uh, to make sure that our faith is bearing fruit and uh, and you know a person has the Holy Spirit will naturally bear fruit now I want to say this the natural motivation of Christian is the love of God the love of God the forgiveness of God the blessings of God all these are the uh, the motivation of God's grace for us to obey God the warning about hell is the last warning is it's not a regular motivation you know as Christians should not be serving God like this and say if I don't serve God I'll go to hell it's not it's the last warning for people who don't serve God 
Christians should be serving God and say, God has blessed me in so many ways. I want to serve God. I want to glorify God. I want to bless people. And I don't want to see these people go to hell. I want to save them. I want to help them. So the motivation should come from God's love. It's not, not from the law only. If the person is motivated only by the law, then he's serving with fear. Okay, let us pray. And if you have questions, please send to me. And then I'll answer when I come back. Okay, let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you Lord Jesus that you have died for our sins to give us eternal life. It's a great, great blessing so that we can escape hell, escape from Satan and have eternal life. Thank you Lord Jesus. It's such a wonderful blessing. We want to be saved. We want to be forgiven. Oh Holy Spirit, please come in our heart to change our lives so that we are changed by you that we want to love God more and have a close relationship with God and want to obey God. Lord, change our lives so that we are motivated by your grace and your love that we, are, that we want to serve you and love you and bless other people. We, we don't want people to go to hell. Lord Jesus, move our hearts so that we are not lukewarm. Move our hearts so that we are not lazy Christians. Lazy Christians actually they don't receive the blessings of God. When we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to us. So when we obey God, God will bless us manifold this life and also in eternity. So we want to serve God with willingness, with joy, and with love and peace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm.